Welcome to the future. My name is Mark Sackler. Thank you for joining me for this inaugural edition of Seeking Delphi. In the weeks and months ahead, we'll be covering anything and everything regarding the future. We'll explore cutting edge technologies like artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, and gene editing. We'll look at the future of many domains of human endeavor, including education, entertainment, and the economy. And we'll talk to leading futurists about how and how not to think about the future. Each edition will feature an interview with a leading authority on a future related subject, along with my own personal commentary on the matter. I'll also touch on any relevant future related news. Further discussions regarding each podcast, along with links to relevant web sources, can be found at the accompanying Seeking Delphi blog at www.seekingdelphi.com. This week, we kick things off with the first of a two-part program on one of the hottest topics facing futurists and the biotech industry today, that of human longevity. Woody Allen once said that he does not want to achieve immortality through his works. He wants to achieve it by not dying. Droll? Well, perhaps. Typical Woody Allen. But unlike Ponce de Leon's legendary 16th century search for the fountain of youth, the notion of eternal youth is not now as far-fetched as it once seemed. I first became aware of the serious possibility of using advanced biotech means to stop or slow the aging process in Jerome Tuchilli's 1973 book, Here Comes Immortality. More recently, the possibility of actually reversing aging was addressed in Dr. Ben Bova's 2002 volume, Immortality. But it has only been in the last couple of years that anti-aging research has moved from the fringes into the mainstream of biotech research. In his 2016 book, The Abolition of Aging, the forthcoming radical extension of human longevity, David Wood addresses the wide range of research currently being conducted in this area, as well as a myriad of related issues. In a two-part interview, I talked to him about his bold forecast of a 50% probability of human rejuvenation therapy being widely available by 2040, as well as the implications for human society of such a breakthrough. Here now is the first part of that interview. I'm speaking with David Wood, chair of the London Futurists and author of the book, The Abolition of Aging. David, welcome. Welcome. My pleasure to be here. Let's start with the most basic premise of this book. You make a very bold forecast right at the top of page one in which you state that you feel there is a 50% possibility that life extension, rejuvenation, will occur by the year 2050. What exactly brought you to this in the, in the broadest sense? How did you get to this forecast? So the forecast I start off with is that we can have widely available, low-cost, reliable rejuvenation therapies by, in fact, 2040, which was about uh, 25 years after I started writing that. And the basic idea first is that these rejuvenation therapies, they're just an engineering problem. There's nothing metaphysical or impossible about addressing the issue of uh, biological aging and that with sufficient effort, just as sufficient effort was applied in the past to many other problems which at one time were deemed impossible, such as flying aircraft heavier than air or indeed going to the moon. Similarly, with enough engineering effort, we can solve this problem. And the next question is, what is the scale of that effort required? And I agree, this is a much harder problem than the other ones I've mentioned so far, but not an impossibly hard one. And there's plenty of indications of work that's already been done that we are starting to make progress along these lines. So my rough estimate is that it will take roughly 100 times as many people as are working in the field today 
in order to have enough people working at the issue to come up with a comprehensive solution. And just to unpack that a bit, I reckon that in the 1980s, when this field started moving more seriously, there were just a handful, about 10 people perhaps, who were seriously studying how modifications to genetics, modifications to diet would impact a healthy longevity, taking creatures living longer than was previously thought to be possible for them. And every 10 years since then, going to the 90s, going to the 2090s, and then the 2010s, there's roughly 10 times as many people uh, working seriously in this field. So today we're up to the thousands of researchers, uh, academics, industrial people, commercial people. And I think we need, uh, as I said, to get up to about a million, a hundred times as many as we are today. And I think that's feasible by 2040. There's all kinds of questions that arise from that, but that's the basic argument. Now, you say something interesting. You say you qualify that as saying, if we decide as a species, which I find curious because I'm hard pressed to think of any uh, of the great uh, scientific breakthroughs in history that were a uh, decision by humanity as a species. Well, let's give a comparison. Compare going to Mars. We have enough technological know-how that if we really wanted to get humans to Mars in 10 years, we could do it. I'm sure that's uh, within the bounds of possibilities. In fact, we could have been there long ago if we had chosen collectively to prioritize it, if uh, the public would get behind political parties that said, yes, we are the going to Mars party, we can do it. In the same way, I believe that... uh, Solving these problems isn't something that one or two individuals is going to do. Yes, there will be brilliant people uh, like Elon Musk in his field, uh, but brilliant people in the field of rejuvenation therapies who will make significant breakthroughs. But actually, I believe we're going to need lots of breakthroughs because this is not a single problem. This is a problem that's akin perhaps possibly to the development of smartphones, to give another example that I'm very familiar with because I worked in that industry for 25 years. The development of the modern miracle smartphone it was not just one person with one insight. It was huge numbers of people in multiple companies, in multiple industries cooperating. In this case, we sort of had the public on side because the public were buying the goods in sufficient quantities to encourage uh, companies to research uh, and invest in R&D in these fields. We need something similar. Enough people saying, you know, this is a sufficiently important field for money to be spent on it, for people to prioritize it for their research. And let's go, go to it. And if people instead say, no, you know, this is a bad thing to do for all kinds of reasons, we should instead be spending money on encouraging people to click on adverts, which many of our brightest people are spending their time doing today, or any of the other things that are occupying time uh, in more efficient ways of ordering coffee or pizza, if that's what dominates our efforts, then we probably won't get to this uh, rejuvenation takeoff point. Interesting. Now, I'm going to contrast something you said with some of my own personal experience. And you said that major collaboration will be necessary. And I'm going to basically play the devil's advocate here on two points. I've spent most of my career in the pharmaceutical industry, and I saw a huge secrecy, non-disclosure you know, agreements being being signed uh, to even go into an R&D lab, even when you didn't know what it was they were developing anyway. And of course, we see the patent battles going on now over, over CRISPR, which could play a, a tremendous role. I'm going to cast that against your collaboration uh, requirement for this, but also I'm going to talk to the example of, of heavier-than-air flight that you suggested in his book, Imagine Worlds, Freeman Dyson cites progress in flight as having been made by perhaps thousands and of competing, not collaborating, but competing designs for aircraft, only a, a few of which survived to be, to be the basis of present-day aircraft design. So how would you balance that collaboration progress versus competition progress? Lots to talk about there. Let's start briefly with uh, solving the problem of heavier-than-air flight. The Wright brothers, or heroes in this particular story, did study carefully what the German glider Otto Lilienthal had done, his own figures, his own research, and they were inspired by that for a long time. 
and later they repeated some of his experiments and they got different results from him. So there was some element of inspiration with people uh, copying uh, and collaborating ideas. But it is also a much simpler problem in the end uh, than uh, what we're talking about. So just to continue this story briefly, of course, the Wright brothers themselves uh, were limited in what they thought was possible. Both of the Wright brothers are on record as saying they thought flying across the Atlantic would be uh, basically impossible. That it wouldn't uh, be aerodynamically feasible. The aeroplane would have to carry so much fuel, it would just uh, not be viable. And other inventors showed uh, new ways to do that. So there were a bunch of people who built on top of each other's solutions, either competitively or collaboratively. Because even when you compete, you often take advantage of what other people who have gone before you have done. But I do think we need more collaboration in this field. And I recognize that there are major structural problems with the pharmaceutical industry, which are preventing the kind of collaboration which I believe to be necessary. I believe there's a heck of a lot of a duplicate wasted effort because of the secrecy some pharmaceutical companies without realizing it, they are both researching the same drug in parallel when another third a pharmaceutical company has already done that research and already knows that that drug is a failure and we spend a huge amount of time on this. But guess what? At least some people in the pharmaceutical industry realize this is a dysfunctional uh, and suboptimal way of doing it. They realize they're in a so-called prisoner's dilemma. And some of them are starting to say, we have to do things differently. And in my book, in chapter six, I refer to the very interesting work done by an Oxford professor called Charles Buntra, who, uh, with the support of the Wellcome Foundation and others, is pioneering uh, in small steps, but it's an encouraging way of a greater cooperation between the pharmaceutical industries. I would also say this, that it may be that many of the most important breakthroughs in this field, in uh, anti-aging pharmaceuticals, will come from outside the established uh, giant companies. It may come from uh, companies whose ways are different from the established companies, just as, in the end, the most interesting breakthroughs in the smartphone industry came from outside the initial giants of the telecoms industry, I'm referring to the likes of Apple and Google, neither of whom were initially seen as a serious player in the smartphone space. Uh, they had different attitudes and different methods, and these were the ones that succeeded. So that's why I'm calling for a grand project involving citizen scientists as well as large companies. And out of that, there's likely to be industry disruption. Many of the existing giants will prove themselves to be too much the victim of inertia, holding on to uh, previous processes that mean that they're going to fail in the new age. And some of them will crash and burn in the same way that many of the greats in the smartphone industry crashed and burn in a pattern that is seen in many other industries too. Let's go on, David, now to some specific uh, lines of research. Do you see any therapies, any particular lines of research presently being pursued that you feel are more promising or most promising to make progress? Well, I do. I think there are a number of different approaches, each of which is probably going to take decades before they finally bear sufficient fruit, which is another reason why I push the end date of this project out until about 2040. There are interventions uh, with stem cell therapies, for example, which I think are increasingly encouraging. We do know that one of the problems as people get older is their stem cells, which uh, generate uh, new uh, cells when they're healthy. Uh, they become less effective and less efficient and dysfunctional. And if stem cells can be reprogrammed and re-energized, that can be literally a new lease of life. So this is one encouraging field. More generally, there's the field of gene editing, which uh, has been hyped a great deal and which has gone through a phase of disappointment, but which is now uh, being approached again more seriously with the capabilities of, for example, CRISPR, Cas9, to allow people to much more accurately and reliably edit genes. And there is uh, evidence, for example, that Creatures can have their uh, mice, uh, in the, or rats in this case, can have their, their DNA reprogrammed, so they are better at removing senescent cells from their metabolism. This is another aspect of aging that 
when we are healthy, occasionally cells die and the body mops them up quite happily and reuses the material in these cells for other purposes. But as we get older, many of these cells don't deteriorate properly and they end up in, sometimes people call it a zombie state. But just to complete the story, uh, uh, genetic reprogramming can increase the ability of these can't remember whether it's rats or mice, to uh, recycle more uh, fully these senescent cells. And that gave them a 25% boost on their lifespan. So that's uh, gene editing, and there's a whole bunch of encouraging uh, lines there. More generally, further out perhaps, the uh, nanotech interventions, which, uh, by which I mean uh, introducing very small uh, molecules into the body, which aren't just straightforward biochemicals, but they have a more uh, an intelligence to target particular bits of damage uh, and address these bits of damage with some programming that might go with them. And I do notice that the most recent uh, chemical chemistry Nobel Prize was awarded for work done some time ago on the smallest uh, nano machines so far. I also look at the developments of 3D printing. We can't yet 3D print reliably major organs, but we're starting to get there. And this will allow people whose organs are failing to have them perhaps replaced by synthetic alternatives. And last but not least, the technology I think is going to have the biggest impact of all, and which has made big leaps forward in the last five years, is the field of deep learning. Uh, neural nets, which is second generation artificial intelligence, in which the software given an initial seed algorithm is able to scan lots of data and indicate and uh, devise by itself what are the cause and effect relationships within that data, what are the principles. And I believe increasingly we're going to see new start types of companies using this artificial intelligence scanning to identify new drugs. And I point here to work done by Dr. Alex Zavaronkov in his company in Silico Medicine. Uh, they are using artificial intelligence and uh, scanning of large databases to identify some existing drugs which have already been through the safety tests. And so we know that uh, at least humans are okay to take them. They've been developed for problem A, and they might, uh, according to this analysis, be reapplied to problem B. So put all these five together, and I think there's lots of encouraging leads. In regards to what you said about hype, I do have to interject something that you may be familiar with. Dr. George Church of Harvard University, who is also affiliated with the, the gene editing company Editas, said earlier this year that he believes that human trials... Uh, to reverse aging using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing could start within the next one to two years. Hype? Reasonable? What do you think? I have a great deal of respect for Professor George Church. I've looked a lot at what he has written. Uh, he is involved in a large number of startup companies, so he is aware of the challenges and difficulties these startup companies face. And the ones that he is continuing to work with, I think, uh, deserve our attention. When he says that tests of CRISPR re-editing human genomes may be possible within a couple of years, then I support that. And indeed, he is an informal advisor, at least, to one a company called BioViva, whose CEO, Elizabeth Parrish, has taken the bold, uh, controversial step of having some uh, gene editing applied to herself. Not in the US, but overseas in places where there are different regulatory regimes. It's not yet using CRISPR-Cas9, it's using different uh, te techniques to edit her genes, but uh, it's a start as to what's possible. We can't encourage other people to rush ahead and do a similar test on themselves. It is uh, a bold and fraught thing to do, but it shows what may be possible, especially when uh, more people uh, pool their insights and get uh, some approvals from the regulatory authorities. So I think it's going to come and countries which stand back and say, no, the, we're not going to do this, risk being left behind by other countries, possibly China, possibly Singapore, possibly India, possibly South Korea, will go ahead with less queens. One thing that interests me in this whole thing is that there are a number of 
drug therapies, even some that have already been approved for testing, that really aren't so much uh, reverse aging, but to slow it. What do you feel? Have you looked into some of these sort of half uh, measures to extend healthy lifespan, but not make it indefinite, not actually rejuvenate? Well, these are very important stepping stones. We're talking about drugs such as metformin, perhaps, which is the drug initially used by diabetes patients. And it was observed that people who with diabetes who were taking this drug seemed to have better prospects of a longer life than even people without diabetes who weren't on this drug. So that made people think it's worth exploring for its general delaying aging. And there are quite a few other drugs like rapamycin and even aspirin, which in various ways do seem to delay the onset of aging. So that's a big help. And I, I talk about there being two disruptions for mainstream medicine. Mainstream medicine is focusing on individual diseases because that's what's been very successful historically. The first disruption is when people look at aging as the cause of many of these diseases or bigger contributing factor to the severity of these diseases. And by slowing down the aging, we will add uh, potentially seven years, possibly more, to healthy life extension. And then the next disruption is the more radical one in which we don't just slow down aging, but which we get in and actually reverse the damage that aging has caused. And so your biological age uh, might change from being, say, 70 to being 60 and then to being 50, and then we are ageless. So that's a vision, and we're going to take two disruptions to get there. The first of these, the delaying aging is well underway. The second, the more imaginative, the bolder one is uh, just starting to have serious scientific traction. But I believe we can get there. And that's what I'm encouraging people to consider. So, David, one final question. I'm going to put you on the spot here. If you had to make a prediction, what will be life expectancy at birth in the year 2040, at least in developed Western countries. Right now, if you had to make that forecast, uh, could you pick a number or is it just too intractable at this point? So no responsible futurist should give you a single answer to any question like that. What we should talk instead about is a range of scenarios and a range of possibilities and with various likelihoods attached to each of them. So there are certainly futures ahead. Maybe I would say there's a 30% chance that by 2040, the average life expectancy of people in the developed world is a lot less than it is today. It might be gone down from the 70 to 80. It might be in the 40 to 50 if a society takes a bad turn. And I think that it's possible that that will be the case. And already we are seeing in some parts of the demographics, people, uh, for example, working class, middle class in uh, both the US and parts of Europe where life expectancy is less now than for their parents. So that's one scenario. The positive scenario, the one that I'm rooting for, the one I want people to focus on, will be that by 2040, there is much less likelihood that people will die of aging. And so we then have to think about the other non-aging related things that might kill them. And that might be at the rate of, I don't know, one one chance every thousand or five thousand years, in which case we would say that the effect of life expectancy would be thousands and upwards. Very good. Thank you so much, David. And we'll be talking to you again shortly about the implications for society. And thank you for joining me. It's been my pleasure. Rejuvenation. Maybe we can do it. But assuming we can do it, the bigger question may be, should we do it? And if we do it, what are the implications for mankind? An indefinite lifespan for broad segments of the population could shake the foundations of society. In our next program, we'll hear part two of my interview with David Wood, in which we deal with those very significant implications. In futures-related news in the last week, The Verge reported that China announced plans to build an exascale computer which would surpass its own existing record holder as the world's fastest. The device will be capable of a billion billion that's equal to a quintillion calculations per second, and is targeted to be in operation by 2020. 
In a study commissioned by Qualcomm, IHS Economics and Technology forecasts some $12 trillion in global economic activity to be enabled by 5G wireless technology by 2035. This activity, they say, will be about evenly divided between mobile broadband, massive Internet of Things, and mission-critical services, representing nearly 5% of the world's industrial output by that time. And finally, several sources reported that Airbus plans to roll out flying cars by 2018. Personally, I'll believe it when I see it. Links to these stories are available at www.seekingdelphi.com. If you have any questions or comments or would like to suggest content for a future program, you can reach me through the contact link at seekingdelphi.com, on Facebook at Seeking Delphi, or on Twitter at Mark Sackler. Thank you for joining me. My technical advisor is Mohammed Marouf. Theme music is licensed from Pond 5. Writing and production is by yours truly. Until next time, I'm Mark Sackler. <laughs>